Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this brand new video series that will deal with uh, the topic of political Islam. And we are going to have a number of video series related to this uh, larger topic, if you wish. Now, I know many of you probably are used to seeing me deal with apologetics issues, maybe sometimes issues dealing with evangelism to Muslims or discipleship of believers in general. But uh, probably you never noticed that I also have a passion that has to do with political side of Islam. What I mean by that is there are some hot issues that Islam taught on or pushes for sometimes in our political arena. And unfortunately, political correctness and terms like Islamophobia get in the way where many people shy away from addressing such issues. We're talking about things that has to do with something called the Islamic Sharia law, for instance. Things related to what does Islam say about women? How do women ought to be treated under Islamic teachings or Sharia law teachings? What about equality between Muslims and non-Muslims? Does such a thing exist? And what about also issues like slavery under Islam? What does Islam teach on this issue? Uh, did early Islam deal with it? Uh, were there slaves uh, under Islamic leadership throughout the history of Islam? Is it still promoted? Uh, whatever teaching we come across that handles all of these issues that I just mentioned, is it still applicable today, practical today? Because you hear things sometimes uh, like, oh, that was in the past. It doesn't apply today. Who do we turn to or where do we go to be able to really get a clear answer. But here is another thing. Many probably of you will say this, but I'm not an Arab, or I'm not a former Muslim, or I'm not familiar with the Middle East, because oftentimes we associate Islam with that area. Or maybe your Muslim friends told you, well, you know, uh, it's there are scholars that know these things. And maybe you feel ill-equipped to handle issues like this. Well, you'll be surprised uh, today and throughout this series to know that it's not as complicated as you might have thought originally. And for that reason, I brought with me here a dear friend and a brother. Name is Dr. Bill Warner. Many of you probably have heard of his name. Maybe even you watch his videos. He has his own, uh, basically, uh, ministry uh, that I'll ask him uh, shortly to address with us and introduce you uh, to it. But the reason why I, I wanted Bill to be here with me, first, we have this wonderful relationship and friendship together. We've done similar things in the past, by the way, when, uh, you know, a ministry that I was involved with launched a book called The Quran Dilemma. Myself and Bill did a number of videos related to these kind of topics that I just mentioned to you. With that uh, said, I'm going to now turn my attention to my guest here, Dr. Bill Warner. Bill, what an honor to have you, and I am so excited that we are able now to reconnect again uh, over such hot topics in our political environment these days. The series we did on the Quran Dilemma was some of the most pleasant work I've ever done. I was Thank amazed how smoothly it unfolded, because you and I had never met each other before this. That's correct. That's correct. So... But anyway, I'm delighted to be here to talk about uh, what I think the most important question of the 21st century is, what is the true nature of Islam? Right. And so I would like, we're going to deal with that today, the true nature of Islam. Wonderful. Well, Bill, why don't you get, just give people just the, you know, the Reader's Digest version about who Bill Warner is and what does Bill do and your website and so on and so forth. Well, I'm a scientist by training. <clears throat> I'm a scientist by training, but my study of Islam started when I was 30 years old. I'm now 78, so I've been studying Islam for a long time. My first interest in Islam was something called Sufism. I see. Okay. And so I was. This was in the 70s, and I was fascinated by mysticism. And Sufism was told to me that it was Western mysticism. I thought, well, I have to try this out. So I went, did, studied with a uh, sheikh for about a year, but I described the, the uh, 
as a beautiful marble palace, but there's some locked doors to the basement and something smelly coming out of the basement, but you can't open the door and find out what it was. So I stopped the study of Sufism. Later I began to realize that it was intuitions I had about both Sharia and Jihad. So that was my first, then I set that aside, and then later, years later I became a professor at TSU in, here in Tennessee, and had many Muslim students. Now I believe if you want to understand somebody, it's good to understand their religion. And so I started, this time picked up the Quran, which we'll later say you know, I shouldn't do, but anyway, I picked up the Quran for my first introduction and read it, plowed through it. It took real effort to do it, but I did it. Then when I got through that, I says, hmm, I need to read about Muhammad now. So as a consequence, I read about Muhammad, and then I went, hmm, we have a problem here, Houston. And so on 9-11, when I saw the second plane at the second tower, I realized I lived in a society that didn't know Islam from anything. Right. They, they didn't know a Sikh from a Hindu, from a Muslim. And so I realized that as a scientist, I love to deal with hardcore basic facts. And so I decided that I would make the sacred text of Islam easy to read. Because let me assure you, in their native form, they are not easy to read at all. That's correct. And I would attest to that, of course, as someone who is from that background. So, but let's start off with how we know Islam. Most people think they're going to know Islam. They need to start with the Quran, like I did. And, and that's the natural tendency, of course. Right. But how many people do you think have picked up a Quran to read it and never finished reading it? Probably a lot. <laughs> I bet you the major majority of the people who pick up a Quran do not finish it. Because it's, it's, it's incoherent, you know, I mean. Precisely. And at first this incoherence passes as some subtle wisdom, some eth etheric, you know, like subtlety or something. It, we just need to dig into it and we'll get the insight. But it turns out the book was written so it's hard to understand from this very foundation. Right, right. And then the other thing I learned was is you don't want to start with the Quran at all. You want to start with Muhammad. And the reason is the logic behind that, and especially from a Western, uh, you know, uh, uh, mindset. Well, first off, if you read the Quran very carefully, you will suddenly realize that again and again, as a matter of fact, I counted them up 89 times. There's 89 verses in the Quran which say that Muhammad is the perfect model of human behavior. Well, if this is the perfect model of human behavior, if this is the perfect Muslim, let's start off and find out what the perfect Muslim looks like, because the beautiful part about this is his life is a story. Right, right. And here's what's important about a story. Most people don't remember facts very well, but everyone can remember a story. Correct. So if I just dump a pile of facts on the table, you're like, eh, I'm gonna pick this one out. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that's not put together. You can pick up a piece and look at it. But what you do if you read the whole story is you now have, if you, the jigsaw puzzle was laid out and you could finish it, you see this is what it's about. So. But why isn't the original biography hard, easy to understand? Because when you study the biography of Jesus, which we can call the Gospels, it's a straightforward story. But the story of Muhammad's life is called the Sirah, which I understand is Arabic for just meaning a biography. That's right. And that's, by the way, my own ministry is called Sirah. And, you know, I did it kind of like a play on words. Because I like that. I wanted, I wanted, you know, connection with the, uh, the fact that I deal with Muslims. Right. Yeah. So... Why can't you read it and easily understand it? Well, it's 800 pages. It's this thick. That's at least one of them. You know, there's so many series. <laughs> right. But if we start with the original Esox, it's Ibn difficult Ishaq, reading. Yeah. It's, e it's difficult to read. I remember one time, uh, I did, what I set as a goal for myself was to make this easy to understand because I said, this is a great story. And it really is a great story. It has spies, counter spies, plots, schemes, massacres, ambushes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sex slaves. It's, a, it's really a Hollywood movie, if you would make the movie. Right. But why, do, why is it so hard to read? Well, an editor of mine, I wrote a paragraph in the condensed version which I wrote. She says, what is it? This paragraph is vague in its meaning. I says, well, here's the original. So she read the original, and she says, well, first off, is the rest of the Sarah like this? I says, yes. She says, oh, my word, this is almost impossible to read. I says, it is difficult. And she says, you're right, the original is amb ambiguous. So just leave it as it stands. But I wanted to make it possible so that anyone could read the story of Muhammad because they will remember the story of Muhammad. That's correct. And you know, it, it's, it's fair to say uh, he is the leader of the Muslim community 
continues to be the leader of the Muslim community. I find it hard to believe that any Muslim would speak ill of Muhammad and feel like safe or even accepted in their community. In fact, you probably can uh, say something negative about the God of Islam as a Muslim and may, you may survive it, but dare you say anything about Muhammad and you'll see the ramification. I mean, you have laws in some countries like Pakistan saying anything about Muhammad is called blasphemy law, right? punishable by death. I mean, what does that tell you about the status of Muhammad? And, uh, you know, Bill, let me, let me say this, you know, um, what is it, you know, that you felt was uh, powerful uh, from your perspective about the biography of Muhammad? Powerful? In terms of, like, something that you felt, uh, you know, impacted by as you began to read in helping you understand Islam, I should say. Well, first off, it made everything very clear. Because the life of Muhammad has two distinct phases. This is after he becomes a prophet. There is his prophethood in Mecca, right, in which he preaches the religion of Islam. Correct. But it's not very successful. He converts, the figures say, about 150 people. And this was in about yes. 13 years' time. Exactly. So that's about 10 a year, which is not very successful. And then he moves to Medina at the insistence of the Meccans. And he changes completely. To he becomes now a politician, and he becomes a jihadist. Right. As a matter of fact, I counted up 95 acts of jihad that he did in the last nine years of his life. What's important about it is, when he died, every Arab on the what we now call the Arabian Peninsula, or within his sphere, but it was a Muslim. So we, what do we learn from this? That there's an early religion of peace, it's there, but then there's also a religion or a politics of jihad, which is there also. Now simply, which one's the real one? Wrong question. <laughs> Wrong question. They're both equally real. That's and right. And both useful. Use, it's like having hot water and cold water. If you need hot water, you turn it on. So that's Medina. If you need cold water, you turn that on. That's Mecca. You can get whatever you want. You can mix them up if you want to. But it's very confusing to the non-Muslim, which is, I call the Kafir. So as a result of this confusion, and people in our world today want to think the best of people if but all possible. And so the part of the jihad in Medina, they like to just... is watered down all the time down. or ignored, you know. You know, Bill, I like to call it this way. You have a marketing message, right? <laughs> and then you have a marketing strategy. Right. And then you have an end goal. Right. So the message is Islam, mm -hmm. a peaceful religion. Now, if you go along with that, great. We're going to keep going in that direction. And the end is accept me in a society or convert. If you start resisting me, guess what? I have plan B now, which is violent, jihad, terrorism, whatever you might call it, or political influence. If you now succumb to my message and accept me, great, you know, we'll keep going. If not, I'll keep going this way until you finally succumb to my religion. Either way, you'll end up with a religion called Islam that seeks domination. And that's pretty much the part that troubles me, Bill, because I come from that background, I understand the message of Islam, but I sense also in the West, people are oblivious to what the end goal behind Islam as a religion. I mean, I'm sure you and I have met wonderful Muslim people. My yes. family is Muslim, so we're not talking about the Muslim people, but the Muslim people have no choice but to adhere to their teaching. Some of them feel troubled by it, so they take the peaceful side, right? Mm -hmm. Others feel zealot about it, the ISIS, the Al-Qaeda, the, you know, violent, uh, uh, you know, jihadis, because they feel like, no, 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 that's what we're required to do. We're in a state of war. And hence, you see the confusion between the two sides. But who's the domineering side all the time, Bill? Well, I'm afraid the man with the gun. Exactly. The man yeah. with the gun, the man with the sword, right. is the one who has been successful. And the Medina phase of Muhammad proved it. Yes. When he moved there, there were very few Muslims in Medina, but a few years later, they were all Muslim. They had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> this illustrates what I call the law of saturation, which you're addressing here as well. But it's, it sounds very scientific, and it is. What you notice is, is that once Islam gets a toehold, if you wait centuries, it will be everything. That is, and it happened in Medina, got a toehold, was first just an immigrant, then finally in the end, Islam controls everything. And we see, for instance, Turkey. Islam invaded Turkey, 
And it took centuries, but over the centuries, what is now the land of the seven churches of Asia, they're all gone. I think the percentage of, of uh, Christians in Turkey now is 0.3%. Yeah, they're shrinking for sure. <laughs> well, there's not a lot of shrinking left to do. Right. But the point is, is once it's introduced, it prevails. And then we needed to tell somebody that Islam is not mean peace. Islam means submission or exactly. submit. Absolutely, exactly. And you know, back again to the marketing philosophy, there is something called buyer's remorse, right? You know, <laughs> and and you have a return policy sometimes. With, in Islam, <laughs> no I'm afraid to say there's no, return policy. there's no return policy. And here's the proof: Muhammad died. Some Arabs recanted, went back to their own way of uh, of living. Right. Did they have a choice? They were fought. It's called the battles of the apostates. Right, the Rita Wars. Why? Because you cannot recant. There is right. no buyer's remorse here. No, 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 no. Abu Bakr made this very clear, by the way. Yeah. He was the man who led the apostasy wars. And he says, no, you know, you can't leave. Exactly. Well, we can cut your head off. You can leave that way. But if you want to leave with your head on, not going to happen. Yeah, and, and, and there is a sense of... And you're going to pay every dollar of the tax Exactly, you exactly. There is the sense of pride and honor and you feel like, oh, oh, if you leave, you're dishonoring us right now. That's one of the reasons why many uh, Muslims uh, despise people like myself, because they feel like I am shaming the religion by deciding that I wanted to follow Jesus. In their mind, by doing so, it doesn't matter even if you're in a closet and you're not speaking publicly, you shame the religion already, and that's why there is the apostasy punishment under Sharia law, which can, you know, amount to death sometimes, as you know. It depends on which country, and if they want to go by the book, death is the pun a penalty. I've met other apostates whose family told them, you're dead to us. <clears throat> we could kill you, but we're not. Instead, you're dead to us. That's right. Exactly. Well, Bill, you know, uh, th this is, I hope people are seeing why this is exciting. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, if you wish. And we're starting, you know, this series just with introductions. Before we close this, because next time we want to talk more about the Quran now and uh, what you term the trilogy, and we'll explain mm -hmm. more about that. Uh, where can people find you online? Well, go to YouTube and either go enter Bill Warner, Political Islam, or you can go to my website, politicalislam.com. And in the next session, we need to talk a little more exactly what do we mean by political Islam, because we have a precise definition. Excellent, excellent. Well, one of the things you're going to learn from Bill is that, as he really mentioned beginning of this episode, he likes to simplify things. And you will see what I mean by that as we continue with this particular series. So hopefully uh, you'll find this particular series to be enjoyable. Invite your friends and learn, take notes and begin to reshape your understanding of Islam as an ideology. And you're going to need at some point to feel sympathetic to the Muslim people because, like I said, they are in a bondage. They cannot. They don't have the freedom of choice to say, well, I don't like this part, you know, I just want to do this. You can't. From a spiritual standpoint, from their own perspective, and a religious standpoint, and the source of authority that is imposed on him, their choices are very limited, I'm afraid. So we need to really develop a better understanding of Islam, but also along the line of the Muslim people situation. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sira International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.